Uh, greetings once again. My name is Mark or Mookie. If you prefer, either one will do. Uh, we are 88.5 The SoCal Sound. Please know that we are listener-supported public radio uh, here in Los Angeles and Orange County. And uh, if you're not a subscribing member, you could sign up at any time at thesocalsound.org. Uh, Liz Fair is here in the Zoom room today. It's kind of amazing to have you. Uh, LizFairOfficial.com is the website. There's a lot to delve into uh, up on the web and in our conversation today. Um, first of all, where are you in the world right now? I'm in my basement. <laughs> Is that where the magic happens? Is that where the demos are cut and, and uh, the, no. the creative juices are flowing? That's that's the sort of my pandemic uh, bunker. <laughs> you know, like, it became the Zoom room, you know. Well, we haven't. Yeah, no kidding. I I know all about that. <laughs> um, in fact, I'm not expecting you to remember, but your show in Southern California in uh, Koreatown, it was at Kiss Kiss Bang Bang uh, with our friends at World Cafe. That was okay. the last live music experience that we had before everything like shut down. Um, and it was Liz Fair and your incredible band. Wow, I remember that, and I think we just gotten back from. We were. I was supposed to be on a cruise ship. Uh huh. <laughs> twenty twenty. Okay, like March seventh, twenty twenty. I was supposed to be on a cruise ship. <laughs> Canceled that, but uh, yeah, I do remember right before that show talking to my band about what they needed to do like i was explaining like take your shoes off when you get in the house <laughs> make sure you wash your hands you know like god what a crazy crazy time that was it was crazy Little did we know it was going to be three years i know and um you know since then a lot has happened i was hoping that we would see a renaissance of amazing new music coming out post pandemic because you know everyone was just sort of in their basement, um, hopefully being <laughs> creative, you know, I, I, you know, I don't know. Um, there's a lot going on with you. The you guy many people are creative, <laughs> you know? Well, yeah. By the way, was that cruise a, uh, a vacation or a rock and roll cruise where you were expected to perform? It was both. It was both. And I really wanted to take it, but I chickened out. There was too much in the news about cruise ships. No. Yeah. No, I don't, I don't blame you. Um, now we're getting back to live music. Um, it's an incredible time for us. It's like um, drinking through a fire hose, if you will. It's like all these shows are coming our way. It's crazy. Um, the Guyville tour has uh, you in Southern California for a couple of dates, but at the will turn November 10th. Um, so we're very excited about that. We also saw that um, you're playing with uh, another artist beloved in Southern California that night, Blonde Shell, which is cool. Um, do you have a relationship with Blonde Shell quite yet? Or um, I guess we'll figure it out on tour. No, I don't yet. And I'm so excited to see her perform. Like, I feel incredibly lucky to have her on this bill. And I am I just responded immediately to her music. And it was, you yeah. know, I was very excited. <laughs> yeah. I feel incredibly lucky. Well, Blonde Shell did play for us at South by this year, our radio day stage. So we are big fans and uh, we feel like it's a, pr a perfect fit. So we're looking forward to the will turn in November. Uh, more immediately, there's going to be a re-release, uh, you know, as we record this interview, a re-release of Exile and Guyville. Um, did you get to um, choose the, the color of the vinyl? I did. And I, I put them through it too. Like, I'm like, it's not quite the Guyville purple, you know, can we try it? And they were very, very kind to let me try to get it as exact to the Guyville purple as I could. Yeah. So you're very, uh, it's um, all in the details. No. Mark. Yeah. Considerate of, uh, how aesthetically, how everything is really supposed to be, you know, I mean, this is your stuff and I totally get it. Um, there's some songs that we play on the radio from you, um, from the exile record, uh, six foot one never said, you know, songs like that, that will, you know, withstand the test of time, if you will. Um, and there's also stuff off soberish that we're still playing like Hey Lou and, and Spanish doors and, and stuff like that. Could you give us a quick background on Hey Lou? Because that's a song that our listeners are probably familiar with. Hey Lou was pretty cool because that was one of the first times that Brad and I wrote together, Brad Wood, the producer of Exile and Guyville, and also Soberish. And so this was, uh, it was 
an actual artifact from a loop we were making that sounded like the word hello hello and so as we were recording the song and i was struggling with the lyrics and he goes wouldn't it be funny if this was about Lou Reed? And we just sat there in the, the studio laughing and writing this song right there impromptu, just like scribbling down the lyrics because we just thought how brilliant if like Lori Anderson is like, well, what's he up to now? You know, like, like what's going to happen? And like, will we get home tonight? And it was all made up and very embarrassing when I wrote her a letter. I didn't hear back, but since she didn't sue me, I figured that was a tacit, like, well, I'm going to let this <laughs> ride. But, <Yeah>. you know. <laughs> no, no, there was no cease and desist order. Not yet. Well, that's fingers good. crossed. Yeah, that's not what you <laughs> want when you're a creative individual like yourself. You already mentioned Brad Wood, and um, is that someone who's helped you throughout the entire uh, scope of your musical career? Yes, he's incredibly supportive, and both Casey Rice and Brad Wood, who worked on Five with me, have been like people I've stayed in touch with that I still respect. I got to play with Casey in in Australia when we played Golden Plains. Is that the name of the concert? It's a famous, know. it's really cool. It's invite only. Like you can apply for tickets to the festival, but you get selected or not selected. I'm not sure what their selection process is, but it was a beautiful festival. So yeah, they've always, and Brad especially, he just stays in touch and is always supportive of my music. It's incredible. It's I'm humbled by it. Well, you just dropped a post on Instagram and it was a, a great behind the scenes photo of maybe a, a session for exile in Guyville, you know, 30 years ago or yeah. 30 plus yeah. years ago. Um, Brad is in the picture. And I think in the uh, the comment uh, on Instagram, you're talking about the release of the song Miss Lucy, which mm -hmm. what started off as a demo, didn't make it to the album originally, but now it's here. It was a girly sound song. I had all these tapes that I made on a Tascam, a four track Tascam back in the day, which preceded Guyville. So I had about, I don't know, 30 songs that I had recorded myself yeah. and never thought anyone would listen to. Never. Th I mean, it's incredible that we put out a box set of this in like 2018. It's amazing. That's amazing. Imagine if like your juvenile scribblings were suddenly important pieces of you know, some of it's really impressive and I'm very proud of it. And some of it's just cringe, you know, but that's what youth is. That's like me sharing old air check tapes of DJ work that I've done. <laughs> like when I was yes. like first starting out, like, I don't want anybody to hear that, but that's amazing that you're able to share that stuff. Um, girly sound. Um, that's your formative years, really. Um, what inspired you to pick up a musician and uh, um, an instrument um, and start writing songs in the first place? Well, I remember when I was taking, I, I took piano when I was young and was always inventive, like didn't like to read music, like to sort of make up my, in fact, my piano teacher told my mother, she's like, I don't think she's reading music. She asks me to play the piece. And then I think she's imitating it. Like I had a good ear. Right. And then when I took classical guitar, again, I felt very frustrated by the, the specificity of that kind of work. And so I started writing songs, you know, I sort of just started making up songs. And at Oberlin College, which was affiliated with the Conservatory of Music, it's renowned for its music school. I was in the liberal arts part, but everybody had a band. Everyone, mm -hmm. Every party off campus, there's like five bands. Right. So I just started developing a sense of myself as a songwriter and recording them privately in my dorm room. Incredible. Um, were you listening to some uh, trailblazers of indie rock back in the day type of thing? Um, and also, do you have an affinity for radio? And what radio stations might have you been listening to? Since childhood, I've been, I'll take music from any source I can get it. You know, I've always just had an ear and it's, I've been attracted to it and sort of, I, I guess I just... Radio was something I had on every single night in high school, junior high, singing the songs constantly. And indie rock, 
God, like Oberlin, the mixtapes that my boyfriends would make me. I feel like every guy mm-hmm. was making me a mixtape at some mm-hmm. point. So I was exposed to like one song each from every cool band of that era. And I used to do my art because I was an art major, right? I wasn't a music, I wasn't going to do music. I was going to be a famous visual artist. That mm. was my big thing. Mm-hmm. So I would be doing these big charcoal drawings in my studio to all this indie music, you know? urge overkill like she hit at all you know i think i'm so cool you know it was, it was a cool time uh do you still draw or do art um visual art as a as a, a way of uh expressing your yourself your creativity i picked it up in the pandemic again Look well there you go okay. i started painting i'm still learning how i guess you know i was a good draftsman but i didn't do i wasn't as good with paint but now i'm like with gouache and in fact the vip package for this tour you get a piece of art that i've done myself in the package amazing that's brutal now, there may that, not be any left but was, is that a piece of art that was made uh while exile was being recorded or is this a, a no new, it's a piece it's of a art? new painting but i painted myself in the rainbow club photo booth take like so you can see my legs in the photo because that's what the guy will cover you know i was in well i went back 25 years later and took more pictures d was there the owner so i went back to my early stomping grounds wow. and did another series of photo booth pictures and my friend took a picture of me there and i painted it for the vip that's crazy how it all sort of comes full circle like that do you ever like pinch yourself and think like how did i get here you know? Yeah. Yeah, I do all the time. Do yeah. you like it's kind of, you just keep doing the things and then suddenly you arrive almost at the end of your career. You're almost on the other side of all of it. You look back and you think, I mean, I'm, I'm kind of proud of myself because I had a lot of stage fright. I didn't necessarily fit into the indie rock crowd very well. And I just kept going you know Mm. and i think that would be advice i'd give to any person starting out just keep going you'll find your own thing how do you get rid of that stage fright is it just the repetitiveness of doing it over and over again getting up in front of people because songwriting is so personal and uh, i imagine that it could be hard for people to share your songs with randoms so true but i also think that the music that i respond to the best and that a lot of people respond to the best is very raw and it's emotionally revealing. And so I think it it comes hand in hand with getting that good music performed on stage. I think a certain amount of stage fright or trepidation, it's baked in. You can't get over that because if mm. you're going to really reveal yourself to a crowd of people uh-huh. live, you're going to be nervous. You know what I mean? And yeah, you just, there's no quick fix. You just have to do it again and again until it's muscle memory. Yeah, that's incredible. Um, are you, again, LizFairOfficial.com is the website. People could buy the merch, check out the tour dates. Again, there's a show at the Wiltern on November 10th, and we're celebrating the 30th anniversary of Exile in Guyville, which is crazy to think about. Um, I was in the studio the other day, and your book of memoirs is featured prominently right there on the bookshelf in our performance space where bands come in, you know? And it's funny because I was in there, I looked and I'm like, oh, that's funny because I'm I'm interviewing Liz Fair like tomorrow. Um, the book Horror Stories uh, is, in fact, a memoir. And uh, what is some of the subject matter that is in the book, if you don't mind, for, for the <laughs> for the uninitiated? It was a bit tongue in cheek because I really pick intimate moments. And there was such a thing in the culture where horror, this horror movie genre, horror TV was such a big sort of industry at the time and I thought to myself I think the most horrifying moments are the everyday things that we don't tell anyone about that we just sort of have filed away in our the back of our brain that still haunts us and like drives our behavior whether we know it or not maybe we see a really bad accident on the way to work we're just like oh okay that happened but it just it's still inside you and I worked for an artist when I was younger, Ed Paschke, who was a famous painter in Chicago. And he told me that what he likes to paint are the bugs that get stuck in the grill, the things that you can't really get rid of that kind of haunt you. Like whatever Mm -hmm. that is, if you're still 
perseverating over it, it probably is impacting your current life in a way. And so I kind of excised all these ghosts in my book. Right. I imagine it felt good then to get it out <laughs> well, there. You had to perhaps. get them out in a book. Yeah, you're right. It's like a horcrux. I don't have to have it in my body anymore. But there's humor in that book and beauty, I hope, at every story because life really is beautiful amidst the horror. Yeah. I read somewhere on Wikipedia, um, and I do believe everything that I read on the internet, that it was a two book <laughs> deal and there might be another memoir coming. Is that true? And what could possibly be said that hasn't been said yet? Oh, lots. There is a <laughs> memoir that I'm finishing right now, and it was going to be fairy tales. It may, you know, sort of a compendium to horror stories, like a yin yang kind of thing. The pandemic honestly kind of knocked me off my path a bit. Mm. I didn't feel happy. I didn't want to write the big happy stories during that time. It just felt different. You know, we all went through it. So what I did is I focused on the, like, leading up to releasing Guyville. I focused on those sort of formative years that I was, I guess, from my parents. I'd, Mm. you know, take my last chance. And I had to kind of make it as an artist if that's what I really wanted to do. And so I take you back to Guyville and I put you back in Wicker Park in Chicago and I let you see the tension between my upbringing and the art world and how these two communities you know, right. changed me, shaped me. And that's what really Guyville became was I'm showing you how Guyville became. Wow. Yeah, uh, that's incredible, credible insight there um, for your fans and and really, really music lovers everywhere. Um, We're excited about the re-release. And of course, these shows, um, they've been going great where you're like adding more shows um, to the tour dates, which is amazing. But it looks like you hit the road starting in November. We're excited about November 10th at the Will Turn. Um, If I show up, I'll be there maybe (laughs) waving at you. Sweet. Um, um, yeah, um, I guess that's really all I got for you. It's been uh, amazing to catch up with you. And speaking of full circle, to be able to Zoom, um, you know, three years after we last saw you, or three years plus, really, uh, is just amazing. The last question, how good did it feel to get back up on stage once again to perform in front of people after, you know, this entire pandemic? Well, the only time I've done it was Disney Hall. So that was an intense and Mm. amazing experience. Like this tour will be my first time back in the saddle, if you will. Wow. Um, So is yet to be seen. But I'm extremely excited about everything we've planned. This tour, I've hired Kevin Newberry, who's a theater director, renowned. And he's helping me with a team of individuals add a little bit of the context theatricality to this performance there so hopefully movements a little bit maybe <laughs> like but it's also just like what's going to be playing on the video screen and what we're going to do with each song so hopefully i'll take you into a more immersive experience with guy though yeah oh that sounds incredible um some shows the visuals are lo- alone or with worth the price of admission um but your That's music so is your music is good so you know it really is all about the music well, that sounds very exciting. Um, I I imagine you're doing other interviews today and stuff. I appreciate you taking the time uh, to talk to our, you know, uh, public radio station here in Southern California. And of course, open door policy. You have an open invitation whenever you sweep through. Maybe we'll collaborate on a thing. You never know. <laughs> 